Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's time once again for another episode of OC Spotlight. The one show, the only show, showing you the most incredible people doing the most amazing things right here in our own backyard. And today, well, we're going to stretch that definition of the backyard a little bit. We happen to have somebody here in Orange County at the UCI Beale Applied Innovation Center, where we uh, broadcast from. He stopped by from down south, and he is working with some people here that we've interviewed before. I thought it was an amazing story to tell. Welcome, if you will, Dr. Patrick Sewell. Did I get that right? Yes, you did. Okay. And down south is what? You, you're going to quickly hear the accent here. Uh, uh, Lu yeah. yeah, Louisiana is where I'm from. Uh, and, and you actually say Louise. I thought it was just Louisiana. Uh, no, it's, I say Louisiana. <laughs> All right. Well, whatever it is, we're pleased to have you here because you're working on some pretty cutting edge stuff when it comes to the world of cancer surgeries, I guess it is, trying to trying yeah. to come up with ways to remove these cancers from us. Your specialty has been for a long time, see if I get this right, image guided surgery. And it's we're really talking about minimally invasive procedures that you've invented. Yeah, years. that's correct. Uh, it goes by another name, keyhole surgeon, uh, interventional radiology, interventional oncology, interventional neuroradiology. There's a number of terms, but the, the commonality is we enter the body using image guidance, CT or ultrasound or MRI, and we can go to selected targets as small as half a millimeter wow. with instrumentation and address those targets with drugs or physical or excision through the needle or burn them out burn them out freeze them all sorts yeah, of things. cutting them into pieces and pull them out somebody once told me that up till recently cancer treatments are sort of like trying to get a sliver out of your finger using a sledgehammer i mean you just smash the body when you uh, radiate all over the place here and it seems like that's that's part of the problem why there's low survival rates here. I mean, you're talking about trying to really go in and find it and minimally invasive, highly targeted, uh, directly remove, not just smash everything that you right. find. Right. Yeah, the, uh, the, well, before we had image guidance, you had to stick your hand in there. Yeah. And you have to have a big hole for that. Right. But with the advent of image guidance, we're able to target just by looking without before we enter. And then we can watch our instrumentation go into the body, but see the target and the instrument and guide it together. The end result is rather than uh, making a, uh, if you're trying to treat an almond and you destroy uh, an orange sized area of tissue. Yeah. It'd be much better if you treated the almond with only, and yeah. and you didn't treat all the surrounding tissue so traumatically. Amen. Uh, all right. Yeah. So you're out here um, uh, and working with some other people. We'll get to that at the end of the show. Some of the exciting things you're working on about regenerative medicine in general here. But uh, having done these kinds of minimally invasive image guided surgeries for a number of years, and you've actually created procedures that other people now follow and use. Right? True. True. Yes. So having done that, you, uh, this is what I thought was so amazing while you're in here. You found you had kidney cancer. And of course, the first impulse is, well, the doctor's going to go and remove the kidney or take half the kidney away. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I want to do something minimally invasive. I'm the minimally invasive guy here. And it was hard to find somebody, right? Uh, yes, it was. Not because the procedures aren't known. And I don't want to get into all the details and mechanics of it and everything here, but but it's not something widely used. Let's put it that way. It should be, but it's not. And there are a lot of reasons, and they're the same ones you hear. Some economic, economics, economics, right. uh, ego, money, politics, uh, lobbyists, etc. Right. All come into play in various degrees. So here, describe your kidney, your story. Tell us your story of how you describe. I mean, it's kind of ironic that the kid, that the cancer doctor gets cancer, but that's what happened. It's super ironic because not only that, I invented this procedure 25 years ago huh. and it's FDA approved and it is available in the United States. If you can find somebody that does it right because of the reasons we spoke about earlier, is there that, a name to it? If anybody wants to look it up or anything, it's uh, kidney cryoablation. Okay. Spell, it's, spell yeah, that for uh, us. C R Y O ablation, A B L A T I O N. Okay. So, um, and I, you, know, you could use other names like renal cell carcinoma cryoablation or percutaneous kidney cryoablation, but the, 
the hallmark is it's through a little incision about a millimeter in your skin. Wow. You, I stick a probe into the kidney, tumor only, mm -hmm. and I apply any any a variety of types of energy. My favorite is cryo, which means the freeze. Right. You can use a laser. You can use radio frequency energy, which heats. Mm -hmm. You can use microwave energy with heat, heats it. They all they all are capable of destroying a given target of tissue. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on the location in the kidney, they have they're equally advantageous or more advantageous depending on the size of the tumor in a different location. So three things, I think. See if I'm correct in any of these. When you talk minimally invasive, I think one you're not going to do much damage to anything else around there. So the chances of the, this, you're going to, you're going to focus on what you need to do. And that means quicker recovery, right? Yes. It means outpatient one hour, two hour surgery. Well, one, for one, one tumor, it, it's typically an hour. And uh, so you, like for instance, uh, a typical patient with a, with a tumor that is resectable, it's the scalpel, say three to four centimeters or smaller, I can, I can treat it completely in about an hour and a half and 30 minutes under anesthesia or actually I don't even have to have anesthesia. I could use a lidocaine. Local, yeah, local. I've done that several times for people with that couldn't be put to sleep. Right. I mean, there's these there are many advantages. Like if you're older, for if you're, yeah, your heart's older, not strong enough. You can't you sleep. can't have an anesthesia. They say, sorry, we can't take your tumor out. Right. Uh, well, guess what? I can do it with just local anesthesia. Do you know they said that to my my father since passed away ten years ago plus, but he had a tumor somewhere, I don't know if it was his kidney or something like that, and that's not eventually what got him, but it could have been what got him. He actually ended up falling and hit his head and brain uh, went to coma and all sorts of crazy stuff. But we were really sweating this tumor growing because at 90, they said, we're not going to go in and get it. There's no way. But it's going it, to, they thought it was going to kill him. Right. Um, and I'm, everybody thinks he's a strong guy, tough guy. No, you think you're crazy? We're going to put a 90 year old through anesthesia? No way. And he'd had some heart issues before that and stuff here. Um, so, I just looked at him shocked and said, so you're condemning this man to death. Well, there's nothing we can do at his age. Maybe a minimally invasive surgery could be used in older patients like that. Well, no, that's exactly why one of the reasons I came up with the idea is because some of the barriers to traditional surgery you can bypass. Yeah. And still accomplish your, tr your therapeutic goal. So one of the things, so not only can you treat people who couldn't otherwise be treated, and you can do it in a more efficient manner that does less damage to the surrounding tissue, the body, and all the other complications that come with that. You're talking about doing it quicker? Does that mean it's cheaper? Yes, them? it's cheaper. Uh, I think probably- Therein lies the problem. <laughs> I mean, yeah, 15000 $20,000 would be the total cost. Wow. Outpatient, two hours, with or without anesthesia. Of course, anesthesia is more comfortable. Um, but, the, but the thing that, some of the details that are, are just as important get hidden when we get glossed over. Right. Uh, so you have to compare this method, image guided cryo, percutaneous cryoablation to a knife. Okay. Because yes. we don't treat kidney cancer with radiation right. and we don't treat it with chemotherapy. Okay. Um, we, there are some new ways to treat it with the immunotherapy, but that's very new and they have side effects just like the chemotherapy. Right. And some of them very bad, right. not as often as chemotherapy. So if I go in, to your kidney and cut the tumor out of the top part of your kidney. Mm -hmm. Say your kidney is 10 centimeters. How, how, how big is your a kidney? I don't even know. Kidney tumor is like 11 centimeters, 12 centimeters. Okay. If I cut out a three centimeter tumor, I'm gonna have to take half the kidney out, which would be six centimeters because of the way the blood vessels are in the kidney. Okay. So it's called a, a hemi-nephrectomy or you're taking half the kidney. Right. So uh, you're, t you're taking not just the tumor, you're taking 20 or 30% of that kidney's functioning tissue as Health, well. Healthy tissue otherwise, yeah. People who get kidney cancer are 50, 40, 50, 60 years old. They have poorly functioning kidneys already. So why, why do you want to throw out more functioning kidney than you have to? Right. When, another reason I came up with this idea, 25 years ago, literally. Um, and uh, and I, I think I mentioned it is FDA approved in the United States now. So yeah, this is what I, this I can't. This blows my mind. It's out there. You would think it would be commonly used and adopted, but right. what's what's a normal kidney surgery run these days? Here, I have no oh, idea. fifty, sixty, eighty thousand dollars. 
uh, uh, several nights in the hospital, uh, or two nights in the hospital at least. If you don't go to the ICU, if you don't need blood transfusions, if you don't need antibiotics, then yeah, you're looking at a couple of days. And if you come out perfectly, versus uh, if you have a complication, you'll be in there a week. So I don't want to throw hospitals under the bus and say, well, they just want to make more money. But wouldn't the insurance companies be all over this? They're trying to cut costs down dramatically. Well, costs costs I'll keep tell skyrocketing. You, I'll tell you a quick theory about that, and it's a theory. I can't prove it. Right. But uh, when Obamacare came out, right. and I'm for Obamacare. I like it. I want everybody to have insurance, good, good medical care. But one of, the rule, one of the ways they got the insurance companies to adopt it is they rewrote the law. Now, this is my understanding. I'm not an attorney, but yeah, right. this is my impression. They wrote the law where they said- You're trying to answer the same question we're all answering. Yes, yes. Yeah, right. They wrote the law saying that the health insurance co companies had to devote 80% of their revenue they took in to give back to patients to be treated, Okay. which leaves them 20%. Right. Okay. Now, if I'm an insurance company and I pay out a million dollars, I mean, $800,000 in care, or a million dollars in care, then I'm gonna get 20% of that million dollars. Okay. I say I collect a million, right. and I have I pay out 800,000 and I keep to keep 200. Right. Well, what if all of a sudden I only started paying for very expensive things? Mm -hmm. And my now I collect, now I'm gonna pay out $5 million. Well, I get to collect five times $200,000. You can see, so the, the incentive seems to be the reimbursements improve. Are. How the more they pay out, the higher higher gross amount they pay out, they get twenty percent of that. Keep it, you see. So, I think that's why one reason they don't want to pay for in an expensive therapy because if it costs ten bucks, they only make two. Is, wouldn't that be horrible if that's the answer that you've come up with something twenty five years ago and you still have to search? It's an approved use. It's been used. Lots of times we're going to talk about how it was used in your own right. save your own life here, and well, t take that kidney. If it costs a hundred thousand dollars to cut half the kidney out, then they get they make twenty thousand. If it costs twenty thousand to cut to fix mine with my method, they make uh, two thousand. Wow. Well, uh, let's talk about how it worked in you. You went and found somebody who did this because there are people who do this. I mean, it's not like this. You're not the only one in the country doing this thing here. No, people have adopted. It's it even music. stranger than that. Okay. Uh, uh, I've uh, I used to know a lot of people that did it because mm -hmm. uh, I train most of them around the world. Right. And yeah, it's your procedure. So right. Right. Study how yeah. To do it. I mean, right. I probably trained eight thousand physicians over the first five years on how to do it, and. Um, and so I started, uh, and I found my tumor accidentally, which is the best way to find a cancer. Yeah. A silent cancer is a curable cancer. Right. It's causing symptoms. It's usually spread into something and makes it much more difficult I to treat. I hear that all the time. Right? Yeah. So I was having some back, I was snow skiing and I fell and my back was hurting and I got a CT to get a nerve block on my lower back. On the MRI, I could see my kidneys and I saw a tumor on each kidney. Wow. Right uh, on the right side and the left side in the top half of each one. But for that MRI, because you're thinking my back hurts. If I wasn't a good snow, if I wasn't so uh, foolish enough to snow ski <laughs> at 60, then I would probably, I would have cancer and not know it, know it still. And by the time it came by, to light, it's too late. It's, it's too late. Right. I would, I would, yeah, if it, it'd still be growing now silently. Uh, and getting bigger and bigger and spreading in my body without me knowing. I've heard people say I went in to get um, a tooth removed and they did an x-ray on my jaw and saw something in my brain or something. You exactly. Know. You know, you, by accident, you discover something there. All right, so you found somebody to do this thing and give us the bottom line. What? What? Well, so I, I, I looked around and I really couldn't, I, I, I searched on the internet, I called people I knew and they said, no, we don't, a hospital won't let us do that anymore, blah, blah, blah. So I have a good, good friend who I trained uh, and he lives in Cabo San Lucas. Cabo San Lucas, yeah. going down in Mexico, beautiful yeah. resort. And so, and, and since I trained him, I know exactly what his skill set is and we've operated together many times. And I called him up and I said, I need you to, to treat my kidney cancer. He said, no problem. So I flew down there and um, I went in, I don't know, in the morning, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock. He treated both kidneys and at one o'clock I woke up in the, uh, in the hospital room and was out the door 30 minutes later and went to dinner that night. And oh I had my. a Band-Aid on the right and the left side. Oh my God. And nothing since. For kidney cancer. Yeah. Well, if that doesn't catch your attention, folks, I don't know what will. These things are not 
maybe science fiction they're they're out there they're right now uh, we're not going to speculate much more on why hospitals don't adopt these things or why more people do it it might be just an old dog new tricks is it hard to get people to to if i've been doing it this way forever i'm going to stick with doing this is it hard to get physicians to change over and try something new uh maybe that's it i don't know and maybe it's money maybe it's other sorts of things but there are minimally invasive surgeries more and more people are focusing on these things and that's what you built your career around discovering these things uh, doing uh, are there other treatments that you've created is this the yeah i uh, i did the world's first radio frequency lung ablation i wasn't the first to publish but i did the first one one of my uh, colleagues published it first so he gets credit um, but basically uh, it's the same thing for lung cancer certain lung cancers i can stick a, a radio frequency or a microwave probe now even some people do it with cryo mm -hmm. and and burn or freeze the tumor in your lung and pull it out and put a band-aid on you wow now, it's not every tumor in every location, right. but it's a good 20% of people. Wow. And the studies have shown within certain size criteria and same location, it's just as effective as getting the lung, getting it cut out with a scalpel and without having to have your chest split open. Does it also, uh, we talked about it's less invasive, so it's quicker. Yeah. It's, it's outpatient. Easy, easy, out, outpatient. Does it heal better? Is it is it more likely... The less damage I do going, it seems like when you cut something in and cut it all out, particularly as you get older, that takes harder and harder for, to recover from that. Certainly. So the more tissue you damage, it's like an exponential increase in healing time. Yeah. Uh, so that's one problem. But the, but the other big problem that nobody knows except on the doctor side is when you, dis when you disrupt a large area of normal tissue and the target, the tumor, all of that area scars and mm -hmm. it's difficult to look afterwards with a CT or an MRI or an ultrasound and see is that scar tissue or residual tumor. Oh, so it, oh, it blocks okay. a lot of your reassessment afterwards, which creates all sorts of complications. Did we get it all? Is it yeah, did we growing? get it all? Well, we'll know we got to get a CT. Now we're going to have to wait six months till this clears up before we can tell you for sure. Right. Because there's so much covering the area you were, you know, you were operating in. There must be other doctors like you that are frustrated by uh, why we're still doing things the same old expensive ways to do this. They're more difficult. They're more invasive. Every doctor or... like me is fr frustrated like this because they're they're not they're not choosing to not give the best medica med medical care therapy or surgical therapy. They're being forced to because of third party payers for their own reasons and for hospital administration for their own medical legal reasons right. that they perceive to be accurate. Right. You know. So there are things like this. Have you had um, pushback? Have you ever been approached by hospitals or medical groups or anything? Are, are you, uh, oh, don't talk to this guy here. Uh, we don't need any more of that. Oh, not by hospitals or um, insurance, insurance companies. But yeah, there's uh, whenever you do something uh, new and disruptive, <laughs> disruptive you, get a, you get 50 percent fame and 50 percent infamy. Yeah, right. And if a million people notice, then you have half a million infamy of infamy coming at you, as yeah. opposed to if 20 people notice, you only have 10. Right. You know? Exactly. So, uh, yeah, if you if you go out on the periphery and people notice about half will will give you accolades and a half will will attack you for for, what, for whatever reason there are yeah. a variety of reasons because they're invested in that or they believe yeah. in that or i mean whatever. look if 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 you're a heart surgeon and you and you've been for and you went to school for 15 years and now you've been out for five years and you're a million dollars in debt and you have a beach out because you think you're going to make a ton of money <laughs> right. and then i'll call you up and i say hey guess what great news you know we went to school together we both wanted to cure heart disease I just invented this pill from a leaf in my backyard that yeah. cures heart disease. Right. We'll never have to worry about that again. <laughs> You're not going to be happy. No. <laughs> I can say, oh, boy. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's what I really want to do. Well, that's a shame because at the end of the day, that's what patients want. Right. That's what everybody wants. And I don't know how healthcare costs have skyrocketed so, but they have. Yeah. And everybody knows it. And as long as somebody else is paying for it, I guess the public doesn't care. But more and more, the public's being asked to care. And... and People looking at all sorts of other payment models. Maybe you maybe you pay for something out of your pocket, and maybe you negotiate the cost, or all sorts of other crazy ideas people are looking at. All I know is there's something wrong with the healthcare system. We all know it. We're all trying to find ways to do it. And when I hear things like this, FDA approved, thousands of doctors know how to do it, and you yourself have trouble finding somebody to do your own procedure on yourself. 
that's a shame. That's crazy. Yes, it is. All right. So what brought you to UCI, though, what got you out of the, the heart of Dixie is and come out to UCI is what? You're really trying to do some other things here in regenerative medicine. The idea that the body somehow regenerates. This is what, stem cells or yeah. cell, other sorts? I don't know how the body regenerates, but we had somebody in here, and I know you're talking with him, uh, uh, Howard Leonhart from uh, Lionheart uh, Healthcare, and this is what he's built his whole career around here and keeps studying here at UCI. Exactly. Well, Howard and I have had a similar career in, uh, in the interventional radiology cross section uh, with stent grafts, and I use stent grafts. He invented stent grafts. Right. Uh, and 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 we're similar in age, so we've lived up. We live. We grew up in the same era of research and invention. Um, and so uh, one of my... I think both of you guys are using stem cells or something because you both look about 20 years younger than I am and I'm not supposed to be that much older than you are. <laughs> <Ask> genetics, <laughs> yeah. The, uh, so yeah, so I got into stem cells in 2009 when I was... Uh, part of my interventional radiology my, is the vascular interventional radiology, radiology where I would go in to the arteries and do angioplasty. Was that some fellowship you did or something? Or was that something? Uh, th that fellowship is called interventional radiology. But, so okay. I was in practice. And, uh, you know, diabetics, they get an infection in their feet often right. because they can't feel anything and they step on things and get to cut and it gets infected. And it gets in the bone. It's very difficult to cure them of that infection because they have poor blood flow mm -hmm. because of some of the complications. And I hear diabetes. people all the time losing a toe, losing a right. foot, losing a leg because they had diabetes. So I was, I, had, uh, I was working on some new, new equipment with a company I worked with where we would go in. I would go in the artery and have this rotational atherectomy device, like a, a football that spun in a, a elliptical orbit. So okay. it scraped the walls. It's coated with little diamonds and it scraped the calcium off the walls to rotor root the artery right. and thereby increasing the blood flow down to the foot. Mm -hmm. That along with antibiotics, IV antibiotics, along with hyperbaric treatment, which mm -hmm. is how you increase the oxygen carrying capacity the of the blood chamber and it forces yeah. more oxygen into your body and stuff right, right. well well i was at the time uh i was in charge of the wound care one of my duties was i was medical director of the wound care institute and they had and so we were using all those things and i was doing the atherectomy and the staff in the wound care center did the hyperbarics mm -hmm. and the and the internal medicine doctor gave them the antibi IV antibiotics and protocol and all that but we still had some patients that weren't healing and there was this new product that a friend of mine in, in Memphis came out with that was a, 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 a sheet, a matrix impregnated with some growth factors like stem cells produced. Hmm. And so I started putting those on the wounds to facilitate- On the outside? On the outside, because right. they have an open ulcer on their foot. Right. So I'd, it's like a skin graft, but it's, it's synthetic. Mm -hmm. And le next thing I know, the, their wounds were healing much better, like almost everybody, if you added the, the, the skin graft, the stem cell graft to the other things. As opposed to 15% not healing, I get 98% of the people would heal if I added that fourth component. I wish I knew you 10 years ago because a very good friend of mine had diabetes and ended up losing his whole foot. And he was a veteran, so they yeah. took him to and put hyperbaric chamber, whatever you call this thing, and put yep. them, put in, trying to get the wound to heal. Wound never would heal, and they finally cut his foot. It's incredibly difficult, uh, well, it has been historically. Yeah. But th but this particular method help, uh, does work the best, uh, and then maybe something out new. Because so after so I got into stem cells, and then ever since then I've been using stem cells for a variety of things. Like for instance, uh, last week I published a paper where I cured a patient's Bell's palsy. They had Bell's palsy for eleven years. Wow! And of That's course, a shaking kind of does. Oh, mean? it's facial paralysis yeah, from, right. from a viral infection. Their face droops, their mouth drools, their eyelid. They can't keep their eyelid open. Yeah. it's like they had a stroke on one side of their face and it's disfiguring. And, and unfortunately it can be an up to 30% of who, people who get Bell's palsy are left with these, these symptoms. Yeah. Um, so this was a friend I, of mine. I know somebody like that too. I seem to, I know everybody and all these yeah, things yeah. are in my conversation in my circle. Well, I, I, I came up with a way uh, to inject his face in certain locations with stem cells based on my knowledge of anatomy and where the nerves are and which nerves are being affected. And to everybody's surprise, 10 days later, his face was working. Wow. And six months later, you can't even tell he had it. And this, just give me a 30 second primer on stem cells. We've all heard people talk about it. it's controversial, it's not controversial, it's common, it's not common. But the whole idea is what? That somehow you infuse something, add something, add, 
put something in there, a cell uh, that somehow does what? Regenerates? They do the they do the same thing that your body's own stem cells do that have lost a lot of their potency because okay. you're getting older. And you can overload the area with many more stem cells than your body can. Mm -hmm. So it's it's quantity and quality of the, stem cells. They're, they're stronger and more. And many of them. more of them. Right. Uh, and stem cells, the ones your body makes, are the ones we inject. Well, once we inject, we grow in a lab. They're not harvested from fetuses. I was going to go there, and I didn't know if we wanted to, because that's why yeah. so many uh, administrations gone by, Reagan and others. Yeah, it was the George Bush era, and Bush they era. were harvesting them from fetuses in, in Brazil, I believe. Right. Uh, and so that that was... Aborted babies. Uh, yeah, that was, fetuses, that was right. not a good thing to do and, and not something to support, I agree with. But for 15 years, we've had ways to get stem cells ethically. Uh, that has nothing to do with that, but the stigma remains. Right, right. Um, so we put in these laboratory-grown stem cells, which are very young and highly potent, and uh, and they're tested just like any drug, pharmaceutical testing for toxins and impurities mm -hmm. and all that. A registered laboratory overseen by the government that lets you sell them. Let, I mean, they're on the market. Um, sure, you can go to a nefarious source and get some, but... Because right. that, sometimes they say you go to Mexico or you go to the places and you can get... You, these things you, that you can't get here right? right you can get that here too uh in the wrong place too <laughs> so it's not unique to mexico uh unfortunately but um but what they do is a when, guy named Vinny pulls up in a truck right and, yeah <laughs> get in the dark van i'm here to inject you uh the uh they secrete growth factors and chemical signalings and they turn on the normal turn on things that your normal stem cells would want to turn on, the mm -hmm. reparative processes. And it's it's complicated at the cellular level, but it's real not complicated to do. You just inject them. Mm. And so it's kind of sad because all it takes is inject them in the right place in a sufficient amount at, on the during the right sequence, and it does it all itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, a monkey could do it mm -hmm. if you could train them to inject in the right spot. Yeah, exactly. And Howard's doing what? Howard's taking this idea even a step further, and he's opening a clinic, I know, down here in right. Laguna Niguel or whatever here to try and extend life. They're going to focus on certain areas, but his goal is nothing less than extending life. Ex well, more importantly, improving quality of life yes, right. while you're here that. and uh, extending life. And so I, I, my work with Howard and, and Lionheart Health crosses over with all these regenerative therapies. Uh, with the stem cells and with the clothoprotein. And I do some- uh, Hit that one again, because that was something he did a big talk on, and I still don't know if I understand this. Clotho, because this protein I've never heard of, that everybody's telling me this is one of the most important proteins out there for regenerating, for growing things, for doing things. Clotho and, is the most important thing that medicine doesn't know about, yeah, is right. the bottom line. Right. Uh, but, but more and more, uh, it, people are, uh, I think uh, uh, Howard sent me a note the other day. There's 3,500 papers published on Clotho right now. Mm -hmm. If you look it up, Clotho does a, 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 a number of things that are critical. Uh, a drop in Clotho in your brain corresponds to an aging brain. A significant drop in Clotho corresponds to onset of dementia. Wow. If you can increase Clotho in the brain, you can reverse dementia symptoms, and you can- Not just stop it or slow it, reverse, reverse it. it. Yeah. And actually, I did a pilot study on that in five patients, and they responded great. Um, I need about $10 million to do the second and the third. Howard's got that much. I know it. He, I'd ask <laughs> uh, And then, uh, but so Clotho is very important for the brain health, but it's equally important for the kidney health. It turns out Clotho, and the kidney is essential to properly regulate your phosphorus and your magnesium and your potassium. And so when Clotho gets out of whack, your kidney fibrosis and you start going into renal insufficiency, which leads to chronic renal failure, which leads to dialysis. I wanted to give you one other one. Maybe I'm maybe I'm playing too much doctor here. But you're just provoking all these incidents that I've seen in the I'm a man of a certain age, I'm a little older than you are, I'm in my mid sixties here. And my late father went into the hospital 10 years ago before he died and he started hallucinating like yeah. crazy and they're like is he dementia i don't know and they tested him i think it was potassium or something like that something pretty normal right, had, right. Had crashed right and therefore he's hallucinating oh yeah that's not that's not uncommon and and there's many reasons potassium can 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 crash there's some other 
your, your, there's some other organs in your parathyroid and your thyroid and things like that have it come into play. Right. But yeah, when you get your electrolytes off out of, out of whack to a certain degree, it causes cardiac arrhythmias and confusion and hallucinations and yeah. even, even unconsciousness, yeah. you know, wow. uh, even a heart attack and die if they get out of whack enough, right. particularly potassium. Um, but, uh, again, something nobody yeah. thinks about it talks about. All right, so, so I, I know we could go for an hour on this. I'm going to try and wrap this up. So you have been focusing. You've, you've come up with all these image-guided surgeries, minimally invasive stuff. As, even though it's been around for 25 years, you train thousands. It's still not probably normal or easy to find these things, maybe because of cost savings, maybe because it just it's hard to teach an old dog new trick or other sorts of things. And But you did it in your own life. It saved your life. It could save others. Now you've extended your interest, curiosity, and, and work outside of your own practice into regenerative medicine. And is... the connection is my image guided skills. Okay. So instead of sticking a needle into your tumor to cr freeze it or burn it, I can stick a needle into your kidney and inject a clotho expressing agent uh, and see where and it regenerate go. the kidney. And, and, and direct it more. Put it in the proper portion of the kidney in right. the cortex of the kidney where there's a filtering agent called the glomeruli and the glomeruli fibrosis and that means it doesn't filter as well and that's what we call renal insufficiency or renal failure if it gets so fibrosed right in animals i can inject the clotho in the around the glomeruli and unfibrose them and they will work better it will they will reverse the aging of the kidney the talk the fibrosis Did you hear my jaw drop i mean you just say this so casually so not only it, we're talking about using stem cells and we're talking about regenerative proteins that nobody seems to know a whole lot about even though thousands of papers have been written about this you're talking about using your image guided skills not just to knock out a cancer but maybe to promote regenerative yeah health. to deliver a therapeutic agent that, that is healing so i can wow. uh, anywhere in the body all i need is a, an access to put the needle in so what's the next step does this have to get tested does this need money is this a research is well this... yeah so right now all my gene therapy stuff is research and um and but i'm i'm uh i'm very optimistic it'll pan out in a lot of areas uh the clotho is i think is going to be a big player in, in anti as an anti-cancer agent with essentially zero side effects but but very effective uh, against a lot of cancers. What do you think about this step that Howard's taken? He's been, he's created patents for, I think, like he said, stints and stuff for heart. That's how he made his fortune and fame early days. He's been working on this regenerative stuff here at UCI at the lab here and some other place. I keep seeing him going in and out. He's finally coming forward and opening up a clinic, a trial clinic that could be, maybe this is, there are millions of them, or maybe this is just the only one, but what do you think of that? approach. I, I think it's a great idea. I mean, Howard and I are pretty much in agreement on everything. It's just what's the most cost effective the way to do it? How can we get it funded? Right. Uh, where is the proper location to do it? Where people to overcome take advantage the obstacles. Of it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. But but what I can tell you is that uh, when you somebody like you hears about this and you say, I don't know anything about it. I never heard anything about it. Right. But if you look worldwide, it's a multi 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 billion trillion dollar industry. So there's a lot of people that have heard about it. They're mm -hmm. just not in your neck of the woods or in the United States, so to speak. Or we're still going with uh, or, old information, yeah. old biases. Uh, I don't want any of those stem cells, how they get them or where they get them, or I'm not sure where I need it them. Has, or, it's yeah. a lot like politics. If you listen <laughs> to only a certain source, that's all you know. Yeah. If you listen to the other only source, that's all you know. Right. So to, to be educated on anything, you have to listen to multiple sources and opinions. Well, that's why this show exists. We try and find out, ferret out some of these other sources and opinions. We always say streaming, not screaming. We're not trying to scream some point of view here. We're trying to have a conversation about things exactly. that people, uh, I don't know, for whatever reason, can't talk about, don't talk about, or don't hear enough if about. If you can't talk about it, you'll never learn anything. Yeah, exactly. And you never discover anything. No. Because we're on the frontier, it seems like, as, as bleak as things seem to be in the healthcare system, you know, costs are up. Uh, overall, I think mortality is down in the United States for the first time in a long time. People aren't living as long as they used to uh, uh, for whatever causes, drugs, stress, whatever, cancers. And yet, and yet, I, I, I'm here at UCI at the Beale Applied Innovation Center where they take technology and try and turn it into something. Research and all these things. Amazing stuff being worked on. I'm, I gotta assume in colleges all across the country here, so. Well, I, I will tell you this. So uh, the United States has become more and more restrictive. 
mm. about doing anything outside of the recipe book. Uh, and so for that reason, I practice all over the world doing this. Uh, I, 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 yes, I'm from Louisiana, but also Montana, also Mexico, also Europe. Uh, I go to Asia. The, uh, it's, it's, uh, if I confine myself to Southern California, I wouldn't be able to do 10% of what I do now. Wow. Wow. So there are still other places you have to go. I hear it all the time. People, particularly people with money, I'm going someplace else to find something. That's I, I'm a, little... a prime example. I went to Cabo San Lucas to get my kidney <laughs> yeah. cancer cured uh, the best way possible. And I think it cost me $15,000 for wow. both kidneys in two hours in the hospital. And a great trip to a great yeah, area. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, how I don't even know where to send people. I mean, are you approachable? Can people find you, or, 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 or are you just uh, part of a secret group working on all these? No, secret no. Well, technologies? well, you know, all my articles that I publish, my emails on there, so people can email me if they want. But uh, I'll be happy to give it to you. Okay. It's Dr. Sewell, D R S E W E L L, at Regenerative Biology and Medicine dot com. Regenerative Biology and Medicine, all of that dot com. Correct. All spelled out. Okay. Well, I just, you know, again, you were here. I know Howard. He says, hey, listen to this guy. And I'm like, oh, we got to get him on. This is more of this stuff. I don't know what it takes to tell this story, but this is a story that needs to be told. And I don't know why the mainstream media is not picking up on it. I don't know why mainstream uh, medicine, why politicians who every day are complaining about costs and rising costs and, and unaffordability of care and all these things. I don't know. It's, there, there's some, maybe if we just start talking about it enough, something will happen here. Hopefully. I yeah. think so. All right. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Patrick Sewell, for coming in today and giving us a mind blowing 30 minute examination of the, not just the future of medicine, but where it's at today, right now. And the possibilities are endless. It seems amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if that doesn't make you want to come back and hear more, I don't know what will. There is an amazing group of talented people here in Southern California and around the world working on some amazing things. Stuff that's not just science fiction. They're doing it right now. And we hope you'll come back and hear more as we broadcast from UCI's Beale Applied Innovation Center.